And we're live. Okay, uh, so just for the benefit of people who are watching this recording, this is now the, uh, the 5 to 7 uh, lab session uh, on Wednesday. Um, we're going to be covering the aspects of, uh, of Inspire that we weren't able to before. Uh, if you are brand new to Inspire, I would highly encourage you to watch the video that we recorded earlier first, because that will cover the basics of Inspire. Uh, and then from here on out, we'll get into the nuts and bolts and usability of, of, of Inspire. So, so that being said, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get going. And what we'll do is starting out is something that we hadn't done up to now, which is really kind of take a, a tour of the interface of Inspire and understand what all of the different regions do and, and what, they, uh, uh, what, what you would use them for. So as we've seen, uh, Inspire is built into this ribbon structure that's kind of the, the modern Microsoft way of doing things now, where to pack uh, as many icons as we can, but also not compromise the fact that Inspire likes to use these large kind of visual icons. We went to the ribbon structure so that we have the geometry ribbon, the structure ribbon, motion, and manufacture. <clears throat> um, and I just realized here I'm using 18, so let me come back and, nope, not that one. I don't want to be using a software, uh, a version that, that you guys don't have, so let me just open this up here. So uh, the geometry, obviously, all of the icons in the geometry ribbon are going to deal specifically with geometry creation and manipulation. Uh, geometry creation in Inspire is very easy to do, and it's based on uh, a planar drawing and then extrusion. So when you have nothing in your model and you select any of these geometry creation icons, whether it's points, lines, rectangles, curves, arcs, uh, we'll start with this polyline right here. It's going to automatically draw a, uh, a, a grid on here. And using this polyline, I can actually come and just kind of sketch out whatever I wanted, some weird shape. And as long as at the end of this, I connect the dots and I create a fully enclosed volume, when I right click to get out of that, it leaves me in the sketching mode, but then I right click again and it will create a surface. As long, again, as long as that was enclosed, it will create a surface and then it enters me into the push-pull mode. Push-pull allows me to drag a surface to a specific height and generate a solid. And so I can, using a sketch, pretty much create any shape that I want to as long as I can go and extrude that out. Then once I have that shape, then I can go and manipulate it. So say I wanted uh, some sort of uh, shape here. I can come to my points again, or my lines again. Now it won't throw up a grid. It relies on me now to select a face to put that grid onto. So if I select this face, I now am drawing on that face, and any grid that I do, or any shape that I do, will be drawn on that. And then once I exit into push-pull mode, I can actually tape that, take that shape and drag it out, or I could drag, if I drag it into the part, it's a subtract. If I drag away from the part, it's an add. It enters me automatically into push-pull mode, but if I inadvertently get out of it, all I have to do is in the geometry ribbon, come here to the push-pull, that enters me in it, select the face that I want to push-pull, and then push or pull it. So I can make uh, a, little, uh, a little indentation in there. I can drag it all the way through to completely cut that off, or I can drag it out to add an embossment to my part. So the way that we create geometry in Inspire is uh, kind of like two and a half deep, where everything that we focus on is a single plane, and then we drag it to, to the position that we want. Which means if I want to put a hole through my part, I just come up here to my circles, specify where I want that hole to go, drag that hole, right click, and then drag that down through and I've now popped a hole in my part. Now everything that I do, whether it's dragging in or dragging out, becomes part of this solid that I have. 
But say, for instance, I want another feature to mate up to this solid, but I don't want it to be part of that same solid. Maybe I want to make it a different material, so it has to be a separate solid. I can still draw, so I'll just come to rectangle. I'll draw on this face right here. But now you see we have this little button that says create new part. When I click that, it pauses a second, it'll come back to the grid, and now I'm drawing on that face that I defined, and I work exactly the same way, but now when I drag that out, and I right click to get out of there, instead of being an embossment on that other solid, it's now a completely new solid. And the advantage to a completely new solid is then I can assign different properties or different materials, uh, different things along that line. So will you be able to, oh, I guess I can try it real quick. Okay, so it doesn't go into the part. No, because it, it, actually, it actually will. It's going in there, but it's creating a new solid into the part, which now means you have intersecting solids, which actually will cause a problem. But that okay. being said, Let's, uh, let me do that. Uh, in fact, let me come here. I'm going to hide my original part. Oh. And if I push pull this into the solid, what this allows me to now do is now I could perform Boolean operations on this. So I could come to Boolean. Maybe I'll say subtract. I'll pick this as my target. This is my tool. And now you see the subtract would end up putting a pocket in there. So it will allow me to drag in, but it, all I'm doing is then creating intersecting solids. So that would cause a problem unless I was planning on doing a Boolean operation to it. And with the Boolean, if I subtract, it will just put a pocket in there, but I can also click this little checkbox, keep tools. And then when I click subtract, it doesn't look like it did anything, but you'll notice that this solid is now there, but now my oh. main solid has the pocket in it, and I have this, so now these are two mating parts that mate okay. into each other. So it's as if I put a little key into, into that other part. Okay. And it's worth noting at this point in time that any separate solids within Inspire are treated separately, and I can mesh them with different mesh sizes, I can establish different uh, element or uh, materials, but if I come here to structure, my structure ribbon, and I come to contacts, you see the blue surfaces that surround that? That's what we call a bonded contact. Those two surfaces are as if I put an infinitely strong crazy glue and bonded them together. So any two adjacent solids will always remain bonded together. So I don't have to worry about nodal connectivity. It deals with that on its own through a, through a through a freeze contact is what it ultimately creates. I can change that. So if I come and I select that, I can change that to contacting. Now what happens is this solid can't pass through this solid, but it's not bond bounded together. So I could, in theory now, maybe constrain the bottom of this, put a force on this, and it's as if I put something inside the other, and now I'm using it to try to try to force it. So it's, they're not bonded together, but they're contacting each other, so they won't pass through. And we'll talk more about contacts in a, uh, in a, in a little bit here. But that's the basics of geometry creation with Inspire. We rely on generating simple shapes, extruding them out to the shapes that we want, and then using uh, cuts and paste or uh, uh, Boolean operations, drawing sketches and dragging them through. Uh, manipulating things like that. Push-pull also, so push-pull will work on a surface and it will drag that surface. Um, and it, uh, it follows angles, so you notice as I grab this surface and I drag it up, it's stopping at this one, so it is respecting angles. Push-pull also works on holes. So if I come to this hole right here, I can actually increase or decrease the diameter of that hole uh, using the push-pull mode. I would recommend against using push-pull to make a hole disappear though. So if I drag this down, 
that hole technically has disappeared. But it will result in some problems with your with your mesh because it, it add, you don't see it, but it's leaving an edge on the inside oh, of your solid. If you truly want to get rid of a hole, come to the Simplify tool and come to holes and remove the hole that way. Don't try to use push-pull to do it. Use push-pull to alter the diameter, but not to get rid of it altogether. Uh, some other geometry tools that we have, we have the push-pull. We also have a rotational push-pull. If I enter that, I have to select a face that I want to push-pull, but then I also have to select a rotation axis. So I have to pick another edge, and then when I do the push-pull, you see I rotate around, and I can push-pull that way, and that will go in either direction, in or out. It's like a sweep. Yes, exactly. It's exactly a sweep, yep. <coughs> Uh, let me undo that and get my hole back, because this next tool, Move Faces, is uh, great for man, uh, manipulating the location of holes. So say I want this hole moved a little bit in that direction, I select it, and then I drag it in that direction, and it will alter the location of the hole. And it will work even if I drag it off of the surface. And I can also then rotate that hole as well. If I come to move faces and oops, move faces and select that, and come to the rotate, I can rotate the orientation of that hole as well, make it an angled hole. Mirroring is of course useful if you need to if you create half your part and you want to mirror it. You essentially create a mirror. You establish a plane, and whatever solid is associated with that plane will be mirrored. Uh, so you see it mirrored one part, but not the other. If I wanted to do both, let me undo that. I come to the parts here. I click, oops, edit, undo, edit, undo, there we go. Uh, come to mirror, I come to parts. I pick this part, and then uh, control select that part, and now if I select a plane, it'll copy both of them. So what's the difference between the mirror with plane or parts? Well, parts, you're just picking the parts you want to mirror, uh -huh. and then the plane, you oh, establish okay. the mirror plane. Now, another nifty thing that we can do is if you select instance, and then I right-click on this. So what it does is it creates what we call an instance. And let me see if the, I know we had some problems with, let me see if it works. Give me just a second here. So you see, if I drag, if I put a hole on there, yeah. when I create an instance, it copies everything that I do on one to the other. So what happens in between of the two? Ah, excellent question. So just like uh, we had talked about with this little plug in there, if I come to my structure and come to contacts, you'll notice that I do have that blue surface there. So they are bonded together. I could Boolean them together, but if I do that, then I lose the instance oh, that I did, because then it becomes one single solid. Yeah. So this is, a, in effect, the same as them being connected because of that contact surface, mm -hmm. um, but I could Boolean it, but then I lose the instance capability of it. Uh, cut is, of course, our way excuse me, of cutting. Cut is by far my favorite tool in Inspire, if for no other reason than I really love the little icon that it puts up there, the little buzz saw. Uh, so the buzz saw will align itself depending upon what you select. If you select an edge, the buzz saw will be perpendicular to that edge. And it will uh, cut through any part that's associated with that edge. Once I have the cut established, I can come to the move, and I can come and rotate that however I want. And then when I click cut, it will have trimmed this off of there. Just have to finish computing. And now this becomes an entirely new solid. If with cut, I pick 
a planar surface, then the buzzsaw aligns itself parallel to that plane and cuts through the plane, or with the, using that plane. Simplify, uh, we discussed uh, holes with simplify. Simplify holes, we'll fill a hole. Imprints is used to remove uh, uh, linear imprints on your model. So if, say for instance, I, did, I, I reconsider this. I don't want this to be a separate solid. I can come here to Boolean and I click combine this and this. Oops, I hope if I were on combine, there we go. And I click combine, it will combine those two together, but you notice that even though this is one solid, it still left that line on there. If I come now to simplify an imprints, and remove, it'll get rid of the line. So an imprint is just a line drawn on a surface. Oh, okay. Not a full cut through a surface, it's a line drawn on a surface. Uh, we know that holes removes holes. Plug also will remove holes, but it does so by filling it in with a new solid, not removing the hole. So you'll see it filled the hole in, but now I have this entirely new solid here. Let me right click and say isolate. So it, it created like a little plug in there, a, a, negative, a negative volume. Uh, partition we discussed in the, the last class, but let me, uh, let me review it one more time. Let me delete that plug. Partition is our way of preserving a non-design space. So if I select a hole and I click partition around it, it will create a separate thin solid. And when I say partition, now I have this as a separate solid from this, which means I could set this as a design space and leave my hole as a non-design space so that it's, uh, it's safe from being eaten away by, a, uh, by the optimization. And then I can do uh, fillets and, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, fillets and chamfers. So if I select an edge, it'll put a fillet on there. I specify the radius of the fillet uh, and I can indicate multiple edges and it will continue that around. Chamfer works the same way, except for it creates a, a, a planar chamfer on an edge as opposed to a fillet. And I have the ability to specify both the depth, so from corner to normal to the face, and the angle at which that, uh, that, that chamfer is. And now that I have fillets on there, if I come back to simplify, the other tool that simplify can do is remove rounds or fillets, which is something we often like to do when we're establishing a design space. We want to remove those rounded corners so we get a nice uh, rectangular design space. Okay. The only remaining tool, and it's almost never used, is patch. And I can't even demonstrate patch because I don't have a model that's messed up enough, but sometimes, and it's rare, but sometimes a solid geometry can come in from a CAD system mm -hmm. and not fully enclose itself. So it ends up being almost like a hollow shell of, of surfaces. Patch will fix that and it'll patch over that surface and fill it in with a solid. Again, I can't demonstrate it because I don't have any geometry. I can't even do that in Inspire to, to mess it up. But that, that would be the only time you'd ever use patch, and it's almost never used. Basically, it fixed the problems. Open surfaces. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the last one here, mid-surface, that's used uh, if, you're, if you want to do a topological optimization on... Uh, a thin shell part, and you want to do it just as a shell optimization, uh, you can generate a, a single mid-surface. Uh, you can kind of see from the, uh, 
from the icon, it's taking a thick body and creating a, a mid-plane surface on it. Okay, so snaps is something also we haven't really talked about yet. Let me uh, delete that. Right now. So snaps, if I come down here to this icon down at the bottom, looks like a little target icon. By default in Inspire, we snap to geometry. Mostly because a lot of the times that we draw things or cut things, we want to do so at specific, uh, at specific locations. Uh, tremendously useful when you need them and horribly annoying when you don't. Um, I'll show you an example why. But for instance, if I come here uh, and I want to cut this geometry, I can, it can snap to the exact midpoint of that edge or the exact end of the edge. So we snap to midpoints, we snap to ends, we snap to circle centers. Um, the problem with snaps comes in if I want to say do a push-pull on this. So if I'm trying to push-pull this, you see it keeps, it keeps snapping to things. Any, any geometry that I end up next to, it snaps to it. So in that case, I oftentimes will then turn off the snaps to do my push-pull a little more accurately and then turn them back on. Okay, so you guys use um, AutoCAD before. It's similar to the snap tool in AutoCAD, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but it's really easy. Okay, um, so that's pretty much it for the for the geometry. Uh, any questions that anyone has about the geometry creation, manipulation um, in Inspire? Again, we're not we're not looking to replace a CAD tool. But by no means are we looking to replace CAD. We're looking to supplement CAD uh, and give you some tools that can perhaps easier allow you to create a non-design space or to create a design space uh, in here from your CAD, but. If you're a master of SolidWorks and you just want to do everything in SolidWorks, including partitioning and all, knock yourself out. There's, there's no requirement that you do the geometry work in Inspire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the interaction for the geometry tool is really simple. Yes. It's easy to use. Yeah, and that, that was the goal. We wanted to make icons that were, uh, that were big, that were bold, that yeah. really highlighted what that function will do. Now, another thing I haven't mentioned up to now is <clears throat> I told you the Inspire way of rotating, panning, zooming. <clears throat> and for years and years, I have joked that all GUI-based manufacturer software creation companies get together in a big super secret conference every year, <laughs> and they come up with uh, mouse manipulation, and they make sure no one else does it the same way, so that anytime you go from one software to another, it, it's a gigantic pain. <laughs> Well, we've decided to kind of break that mold. If you come here to the file pull down, come to preferences, and come to mouse controls. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So I come to file down here at preferences, and then mouse controls. You see, it says same as Inspire. If you select that, <coughs> you'll see all of the popular CAD packages there. Uh, if you're a SolidWorks master and you're familiar with zooming, panning, rotating, and SolidWorks, select that, and then you don't have to bother learning a new oh, way of really doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I like one feature you have. That is right-click to confirm. Oh, yeah. yeah. I also use in my own software. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, so that's, that's kind of it for the... Uh, Geometry, you see every time I created a new solid over here, whether it was by uh, drawing a new solid, creating an instance, slicing something off, mirroring something, <coughs> I see that represented in my model browser. If you don't have your model browser up, you can come to View and select Model Browser mm -hmm. yeah. and View and Property Editor. Uh, so each one of these is now its own separate solid. I can control the visualization of these by turning on or off these little uh, these little icons to the left. I can also isolate things by just right clicking on a specific part and select isolate.
and then if I want to show everything, I just go up to the very top of the, uh, the uh, ladder here, right click and say show, and that will show everything. I can also control visualization with this creepy little eyeball icon down here. So if I select that, you see my pointer gets that little uh, modifier, looks like a little black star. Any geometry I pick now goes into a ghost mode, and when I right click to get out, it, uh, it goes hidden. If I come back in there and I hold my shift key down, that manipulates to a little white star, and I can turn things back on and off again. There is absolutely no difference between doing it graphically and selecting the little icons there. It's just if you've got a model with a dozen or a hundred different parts, sometimes it's easier to do it graphically than to try to figure out which part is on there. Yes, sir? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's taking the material properties in. So right now, this this is going to be made, uh, the material that it has, uh, that, it, that this is made out of, or that it's assuming it's made out of, is steel AISI 304. And the only reason it's doing that is if you come again back to preferences and come to materials, the default material uh, is steel AISA 304 because it's just up at the top of the list. So every <laughs> geometry you bring in will automatically be assigned that steel and that's where the mass comes from. You can change that default to anything that you want or if I just want to come and right click on this and select a new material. So I'll make this aluminum and you'll notice 18.742 has now reduced down to 8.058. So as soon as I change material it automatically updates that. So that is a live and actual mass of your cell. And that's going to be based off of the uh, mass density that you put into, into the, uh, the, the material definition. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of it for, uh, for the geometry. Um, let me see if there's a few other things that we can do here. Um, any, any model uh, or any part can be renamed, so just right click on it and somewhere in here, rename. So I, I, I like to name my geometry, it makes it a little, a little easier to identify it. Uh, another thing is I the design space will always show up as that red, but all the other parts, if I uh, select them and I can come down to the property editor, I can change the color of, uh, of any part. Um, some people like to do that. Uh, most people, that's not really not their thing. They're cool. pretty cool with the red versus gray, but if you really want to color your parts, you can, you can do that. We can also affect the transparency of them. Uh, so again, if I select it either from the browser or from graphically here, I come down to transparency. Uh, it is a percentage of transparency, so 0% transparency is fully opaque. 100% transparency, you can't see it. So if I change it to 25% transparency, it's 25% transparent, not 25% visible. So the higher the number, the more transparent it becomes. And that's useful if you know you you still want to see the part, but you also want to see what's going on inside of it. Uh, the rest of these a little bit more advanced functions that people tend to not change, but auto calculate mass. I can turn that off. And I can override the mass. Uh, the, really, the only time you'd ever do that is if you were truly really trying to represent something that was non-homogeneous. So the mass calculation is wrong. But since we don't support non-homogeneity, is that even a word? Uh, you can force it to override the mass calculation. Again, not something people do very often. Um, permissions. I uh, detect collision and movable. Everything by default is movable, which means I can take it and shift it at a location. I can do that with the mouse if I come again back up to the file, preferences, 
and I change my, uh, where is it at? I can never remember which one this is. Give me just a second here. Controls. Oh, there it is. Uh, modeling space, you see move or box select. If I change this to move and click OK, if I grab a solid, I move it out of location. If I want this to go back, I can grab this solid and then if I, gra if I go to the end here, it sees that end and now if I hold my left mouse button, I'm grabbing it by that end and I can snap it onto that end right there. If I do this and now deselect movable, I can't grab and move that. I can grab and move that, but not the other. So movable just allows it to be moved. This used to be incredibly valuable before when the left mouse button was always move because you'd inadvertently move stuff all the time. Yeah. It's not so important now. But. Now if I come back and I change back to box select instead of move, box select allows me to select multiple things at once. So by dragging, left dragging, I can pick multiple solids at the same time. The neat thing about box select is if I drag left to right, any solid that that box touches gets selected. If instead I drag right to left, only solids that are fully inside the box get selected. So depending left to right, right to left, you can control what you select. Uh, finally, coming down here, <coughs> excuse me. If you come to in the property editor with a uh, with a uh, solid selected, auto calculate element size. So by default, it's going to automatically calculate the element size. We don't deal with elements in Inspire. We try to keep them in the background. But as FE engineers, we know that at the end of the day, we are going to be meshing this. <clears throat> Auto calculate element size will be based upon the overall size of your part. It'll try to calculate an appropriate element size. That can be overridden. So if you absolutely want to make sure you have a finer mesh, you can deselect that and then give it a minimum element size and an average element size. So you can override the automatic element size. Uh, how did you move uh, a part of this? You have to come to the file pull down. So like movable? Oh yeah, so movable, but then you also have to change the function of your left click. So you oh, come to the file pull down, okay. and then go to preferences, and under modeling space you'll see move or box select, change that to move. Now, if it's movable, you can drag it out of location. Awesome. Okay. But if it were, if you didn't have movable selected, even using that, you couldn't drag it out of location. Okay. So. And then finally, mass moment of inertia uh, just gives you. It's a convenient way to get your moments of inertia on anybody and then you can override that, but I would highly recommend not overriding it because you can really mess things up if you, if you override the mass moment of inertia and come up with some weird numbers. Uh, it's going to really wreak havoc on your FEA. So how to make it additive? Oh. Yeah, okay. and then you, then you just click that. Okay. Um, so questions about geometry before we uh, before we move on. Okay, in that case, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to open up uh, exercise four. And now we're going to talk about connections in Inspire. So this is a nifty little model of a uh, quadcopter, or drone. Yeah. And 
so we discussed that any two adjacent or any adjacent solids are automatically bonded together. So we never have to worry about connectivity. And if we come to our structure and we look at, we come to contacts again, we can see all of the contacts throughout this model. It has to calculate them. So the first time you select contacts, it will take a, a second to do that. But now you can see the, the, the contacts. So any two adjacent solids will have a uh, bonded contact between them, which is great out here on the end, because this little end should be bonded to the, the arm. But what ends up happening is this is now an inappropriate representation of this model, because, because the way that this quadcopter is put together is each one of these arms is slid between these two plates and then uh, two bolts and two screws going to hold it into place. But if we look at the contacts, you'll notice that the entire upper surface of that arm and the entire lower surface of the arm are bonded to the upper and lower plate. So let's imagine what happens if we put a force onto this. So we're gonna put our little, uh, our little engine in here, motor in here, put a propeller on and we're going to lift this thing off. This is going to provide an upward force on this, trying to pull it off. You have to see the inertia of the body is going to want it to not pull off. So you're going to end up pulling up on this. Well, in reality, the load path would go through the bolts and the screws because that's what is holding it in place. But what we've simulated here, because those are bonded together, you're actually pulling on that entire surface on the top plate and the bottom plate of the quadcopter, which is wrong. It would run fine, but your results would be a bit wrong because that's not the reality of the situation. And what somebody has done is they've gone through and they've modeled all of these bolts with just these little solid, uh, these little solid slugs. And you'll see even with those, if I come back to my contacts, they're bonded all the way through because again, it's solid to solid contact. So this is great and it would run, but it would, your, your results could potentially be substantially off because of the way it's treat, cre, uh, treating the load path through there. So what I want to do is I want to get rid of all of these bolts. It was great that somebody modeled them, but they're not useful to me. Fortunately, the one good thing they did is label them all hexagon socket heads, so I can just come here and do a shift select in my browser and delete them, and then grab the remaining ones down here, shift select, and delete them, and now those are all gone. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use our fasteners option in Inspire to now fasten these the proper way. So if I come to fasteners, Fasteners looks for uh, collinear holes, or, or holes that are, are line up along an axis. And it's identified them in red. So it looks for, it saw the hole in the top plate, the hole through the arm, the hole through the bottom plate, and identified that. In this case, it's identified the hole in the top plate and a hole that doesn't run entirely through the arm. If I click Fasten, it's going to go ahead and put uh, nuts and bolts, or uh, bolts and screws in there. So fasten, uh, click the fasten all. Oh, we can fasten all right there. Got it. And now it's created these little bolt and screw representations. Anywhere it's a through hole that goes all the way through the model, it puts a bolt. Anywhere it's a blind hole so it doesn't go all the way through, it puts a screw. And in now if we come back and look at contacts, it automatically updated all of my contacts to contacting. Oh, yeah. Meaning they're not bonded together, they can't pass through, but there's nothing preventing them from sliding against each other, except for the fact that we've got the bolts in there now. So now it's a true and accurate representation because the bolt is handling the load path, not a bonding between the two solids. So while the other one would run, the results would be potentially incorrect. Now the results would be much more accurate. The one thing it failed to do, though, was identify 
the bolt that went through these two holes here. And the reason it did is because these holes are so far apart. But I can resolve that again by coming to the fasteners. I left click on the top hole, left click on the bottom hole, and click the top hole again and it will force them to, so now just go click the top hole again and it will force them, it force putting a, uh, a bolt through there. Okay. Yeah, so this is a much more accurate way of representing the connections. It's actually not creating the, uh, the actual bolt or screw. It's going to generate a 1D representation of them in the, in the FE model. But it's going to very nicely create this, this nifty graphic little representation on the screen so you can make sure that everything's bolted correctly. And the big difference between the bolt and the uh, screw, the bolt will uh, create connections at every interface, but not along the, the barrel of the, solid, of the solid. The screw will create connections along the barrel of the solid, so representing uh, thread engagement. So this is a, a much more accurate representation. Okay. Cool. Moving right along. Okay, so now, um, let me do this. Let us I want to show you another thing here that can arise from time to time, but not always. So please feel free to work along with me if you want. Uh, otherwise, you can just watch along. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a little box here. Doesn't matter the size. And then I'm going to extrude this up into a shape. And do a rectangle, and then I'm going to come and I'm going to draw a circle on this. And I'm going to drag that through to create a hole through. Then I'm going to come to my simplify tool, and once I have my hole, I'm actually going to plug that hole. So I'm going to create a separate body in here. So now I have two solids. Now the reason I'm going to do this is going to show you a huge difference between uh, sliding and sliding with separation. If I come here to my structure and analyze, you see one of the options that we hadn't talked about yet strictly because uh, it's a complex thing, we just haven't had the time, but fortunately we do now. One of the options here for contacts is sliding only and sliding with separation. So as this is modeled right now, we know we have a bonded contact. And I know that if I select that bonded, I can change it to contacting. Contacting means that that pin actually now is free to slide in and out. It's not bonded in there. And where I first encountered this and where we had to do some experiments on it, was when I was teaching at uh, uh, GE Aviation. And if you've ever seen how a jet engine connects to a commercial aircraft, uh, first of all, if you fly a lot, don't ever look into how a jet engine connects to a commercial aircraft. It's scary how little actually is connecting it there. Um, but the, main, the, the way that the thrust is, is transmitted from the engine to the body of the plane is through what they call a thrust pin. Mm -hmm. It's a big, about five inch diameter pin that fits into a, a fixture on the engine and then fits into a fixture on the wing that then transmits the thrust from the engine to the wing. And they wanted to simulate that thrust pin. Well, when I ran the analysis, or when we ran the analysis initially, what ended up happening, and let me, uh, let me come back here come to structure and let me switch this back to bonded and I'm going to just quickly come here and fully constrain that end right there 
and then I'm going to put a force on this and I'm going to point it in the X direction and we'll say um, 10,000 newtons put a force there 10,000 newtons and now what I have to do because of the way this is uh, what would end up happening is the pin would start sliding out because it doesn't have any constraints there I'm actually going to put a constraint on the end of the pin but I'm going to free that up to move in that direction and in that direction and then I'm going to do the same thing on this side and so now the pin will stay in the hole but it can it can fly now if I run this analysis and this should take uh, this shouldn't take too long to run but if I run this analysis that pin is going to want to pull on that or uh, is going to, to shift inside that hole um, and the force is going to, because it's a bonded connection, is going to be exerted to, oh, you know what, darn it, I didn't want bonded, delete, sorry, I'm going to yeah, clear that, I actually wanted this to be sliding, there we go, I didn't want bonded, so the pin is free to slide in there, but when I run the analysis, what you're going to see the way that contacting works is imagine you take two incredibly strong magnets, put some oil between them, and then slap them together. They're free to do this, but if you try to pull them apart, they can't be pulled apart. That's what the sliding separation does. Those faces will always stay in contact with each other, but they can slide, but they can never pull apart. Well, imagine what happens with this pin when I do that. Because it can slide up against it, but it can never pull apart, what's going to end up happening, as you're going to see, is it's going to pull, it's going to push in this direction like I would expect, but it also ends up pulling on the back wall because it's not allowed to separate from the back wall. And so we end up with a very incorrect uh, analysis. I was kind of hoping this was going to run a little bit quicker. Um, but. Uh, what we ultimately did then is when you go to the analysis there's this option for sliding with separation what that does is if it detects that that contact wants to break apart it will allow it to happen so it won't push through but it will be able to pull away from the back wall and we get a much much more accurate representation um but i'll show you i'll show you the representation of that so that's what sliding only versus sliding separation does. Um, let's see where we're at with the analysis. Oh, we're almost done. Yeah, almost done. Okay. Oh, good. There it is. So now when I run this and I go to von Mises stress, look where most of the stress is. It's actually on the back of the pin, which is obviously completely wrong because it's it's trying to pull that back face. But now if I instead analyze this sliding with separation and I click run now we'll get a much more accurate representation so it's off by default because it can potentially add substantial time to your analysis because it's always checking to see if those those surfaces are trying to separate from each other but if you do anticipate separation make sure you flip that switch and you get a much more Yeah, actually, I think for the finite element analysis, besides the, the element you choose, besides what kind of uh, method you choose, very important thing is to set up the properly oh, yeah. proper uh, boundary conditions. Yep. Right. Yeah. 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 I have I have long said that finite element analysis is is very dangerous because it's really easy to get an answer with FBA. It takes a pretty big mistake to actually make it unanalyzable, if that's a word, which it probably isn't, but you get the <laughs> idea. It's, it's actually relatively difficult to make something not run. Mm -hmm. But it's insanely easy to make something run and get the wrong answer. Uh, a simple mistake on a boundary condition. Uh, blowing the order of magnitude on your Jung's modulus, which you know, if you're dealing with something that's got seven zeros behind it, pretty easy to leave one of them off. 
and you don't know because it works fine, it runs fine. So FE is very easy to make a mistake. And one of the biggest and most difficult things to do with uh, FE, because of the limitations of the tools that we have, is, uh, that's interesting, <laughs> uh, is uh, to misrepresent, there you go, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably, it was just too big of a force on there. But you see what's happening is, aside from the fact that it's penetrating, it's becoming way too nonlinear is the problem. I put way too big of a force on there. But see how it's separating from the back? This is a much more accurate yeah. representation. Yeah, what's happening is the contact is failing because it's, it's too highly nonlinear. The contact has just fallen apart. But if I dropped the uh, the value of that uh, that force uh, from ten thousand to maybe one thousand, it'd be a much more accurate, uh, much more accurate. In fact, let me do that. Uh, if I return from this, and I just come to this force, and I change this to one thousand newtons, and change this to one thousand newtons, and run it again, you'll see it's it's a lot more accurate. So messing up an FE is really easy. You always have to be cognizant of your situation, of the, uh, of the model. Make sure you're accurately representing the reality of, of your situation, and you'll be much happier with the result. And if something looks weird, if something looks not right, it probably isn't. So don't assume you know, that the analysis, okay, you're finished, if you gave me a result that's right. Always double check. <coughs> I, I had a question today. We went over a uh, just a standard beam analysis. We had put the force at the face of the end of it. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to put a force at a point yeah. on the face? Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, let me, as soon as this is done, let me show you how to do that. Okay, so let's see now. Uh, so that's still... I have to see what's going on, why it's, why it's penetrating like that. Um, yeah, I don't know what's happening there, but I'll, I'll I can figure it out. Yeah, so if you want to put a, um, so let me come here. Let me come to new. Don't save. And I uh, let me come to geometry, and we'll create my little box there. Drag my little box there. And I'm going to come back to structure, and just like we did with the cantilever beam, I lock that in place. Okay, so yeah, I put it on, on the face. Say I wanted to put it just on a point. All I have to do is come to geometry, point, select that surface to put the point on, indicate where I want that point to be, and now if I come to forces or to loads, I can select that point and that it will be applied at that point. Oh, okay. And similarly, say I didn't want to put it at a point, but maybe I have a, uh, maybe I have something contacting this along the top, a, a, little, a little rectangular area that I'm pushing down on. I could come to geometry, come to rectangle, draw on this face, oh. draw, the rectangular area, right click and right click and not do the push pull. But now I've segregated out that square so I can put it just on that surface right there. Okay. Does that work as well with pressure? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so somebody um, in uh, uh, Dr. Sundaram's class when I was, I was doing that, they uh -huh. were asking if they could create a uh, 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 varying pressure across something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's simple to do. You can't do it just on that face, but if I come to this face here, and I come to line, and I draw on this face, and I draw a line from there to there, and draw a line from there to there, and draw a line from there to there, any sketching that I do on that face, as long as I don't actually do the push-pull, now I can come to structure, I can put a pressure on that surface that's different than the pressure on this surface that's different than the pressure on this surface. So any sketching I do on a surface, whether it's a line, a circle, a square, or a point, 
will give me something on that surface to apply things to. That, that is very straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, so now I, all I have to do is I come back to here. I could set this for 3 MPA and come to this one. 5 MPA, come to this one, set it for 7 MPA, and now I have a varying pressure going across that zone. Across that zone. Okay. So, student, so pressure on both pores can be changed during time or something like that? No, no, this is strictly uh, static, so there's no, there's no time. So it's not a dynamic system? No, it's not a dynamic system. And that's just because the Optistruct is non-dynamic yeah. and also optimization has to occur in a static yeah. situation. I understand. Is there a straightforward way to model tubing and stuff or do you have, kind of have to just hollow it out and show it out? Uh, yeah, that would be the only way within Inspire to do it is to, to hollow it out. But you can download some. But I could, yeah. You, 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 if you can create it easily in SolidWorks, then just go ahead and do that. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to just quickly take away all forces and? Uh, uh, not graphically. Uh, what I could, but I, what I can do is I can come here to my loads and displacement. Uh, the the bottom one shows me my load case. The top shows me all of them. Yeah. I can just click on the top, shift click on the bottom, and delete oh, okay. all of them. And then in SolidWorks, let's say you have like a frame for a car or something like that, and it's welded together when you import it to Inspire. Will Inspire know that that's the weld location? Yeah, it, well, it will know if the solids are touching each other. It creates that that bonded uh, that bonded contact. Okay. Uh, if you have a uh, like a graphical representation, well, so for instance, um, let's do this. File new. This is interesting that you should ask that because I we I was developing a way with a customer on representing a weld. So what we did is we took this and. Then I dragged that to there. Mm -hmm. Then I came here and I clicked on this surface because I want to sketch on this surface, but I want a new part. Yeah. And then I dragged from here to there. And then if I go to push-pull, I can push-pull until it snaps to that end. So now I have them right there. Right. Um, I can come and come to my structure contacts will change this to bonded so they're no longer bonded and what they wanted to represent was like a little seam wheel across yeah. here so all we did was we came here to geometry I'm gonna again I'm gonna come to lines or we'll do polylines I'll sketch on this face here create a new part and then I came from here to here to there to there right clicked and wait for it to get into push-pull and then again I dragged it until it snapped right there yeah. and now I, l I just left that at bonded and now you'll see if we look at the contacts it's bonding at the seam well mm -hmm. to the top and the bottom plate the two bottom ones can't can't pierce each other and if I turn on that sliding with separation they in theory could do this and thus the seam well is going to take all of the stress of that. Okay. And because the seam weld is melting of the material, it's the the frozen contact, that bonded contact, will act perfectly as a representation of it. Okay. So a little bit of work, but I can get a pretty good representation of that. But that if well. you have, let's say, a seam welder in your shot where it's designed already, do you have to identify that as a contact point? It will automatically identify it as a contact point if they touch. You just then have to go through and review the contacts to make sure that the the beam the things that are touching each other are contacting, but the welds themselves are bonded. Okay. Yeah, fortunately, I've had a ton of times where I've had to develop weird new things with a lot of customers. <laughs> so it's great because when people ask me questions, like, "Oh, yeah, I did that," and, and we came up with, it, with this method. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's fun stuff, and you know the thing about it is, um, say I wanted to constrain 
that surface right there. Yeah. That surface is now constrained, and it's constrained at the angle of the surface. To do that exact same thing in a traditional FEA system would be quite a complex thing. You'd have to go through, you have to create a secondary uh, coordinate system that aligns with that surface. Then you have to assign that secondary coordinate system to all the nodes across the face, and then you have to create constraints on all the nodes of the face, and then it will reference. With one click, I did the same thing that would take me about five minutes to do, or 10 minutes to do in an FE system. Um, other things that we haven't talked about, uh, non-structural masses. If I wanted to represent something hanging off of this, I could put a non-structural mass on it, and then uh, I could just come here. I can shift that out to the center of gravity, so I can drag it out. Or if I know the coordinates of the center of gravity, I can just type them in right there. And then I give it a mass, so I could say, you know, 100 kg. And then if I click that attachment, I can attach it to that point right there. And now it's as if this lump mass is physically connected to that surface, pulling down on it. And when I run my analysis, I just make sure that gravity is turned on. And now that's an alternative way of, of analyzing this. So that, uh, that door hinge, maybe I didn't know that it was 4,000 newtons putting down. But I knew what the mass of the door was, and I knew what the CG of the door was, and I could connect it to that pin, and then I could run the analysis without even knowing what the, what the force was. Of course, if I do that, the one other thing I have to do then is I have to come to this gravity. You see right now, gravity's pointing in the wrong direction because it automatically goes negative Z. Yeah. I, I just come to gravity and I specify Y and make, it, make sure it's in the negative Y. And then I can even alter the gravitational acceleration. It defaults to Earth standard <laughs> gravitational acceleration. But if you want to analyze something on the moon or <laughs> Jupiter or whatever, you can change that. Uh, also, in addition, I can do g-force loading. Don't do g-force loading by altering the acceleration of gravity. Do g-force loading by coming to this guy right here, selecting the part you want to do a g-force load on, specify how many g, and it will, it will do that based upon the, uh, the gravity history. Yeah. That would be unfortunate. <laughs> And then temperatures, uh, you just select the temperature. Temperature is applied to an entire solid, uh, and it's just a delta T. It's not a heat transfer, it's just a uh, uh, deformation, you know, essentially coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay. It was kind of funny. I was teaching this, uh, we had a take your kid to work day at Altair, and one of the, we wanted to show these kids uh, uh, Inspire. Yeah. Um, and it was great for the high school students, but for like little kids, uh, they sat in there and they found the temperature thing and they just kept doing this, oh, my part's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> what is uh, the beam pattern? Beam pattern ah, great, okay. So we have another type of optimization called topography. Topographical optimization is done, it only works on surfaces. So you have to do uh, have to do surfaces, and what uh, topography does is it does an optimization to stiffen your part up by adding beads onto it. So you know if I just take a uh, if I take a flat sheet of metal, I can make you know cool thunder noises by by flipping it. It's got almost no structural integrity. Um, but if you've ever seen like a Quonset hut or the corrugated aluminum. Uh, if you add beads to it, it adds a tremendous amount of stiffness to it. Mm -hmm. So what uh, topo uh, topographical optimization does is it stiffens up a shell structure, a surface structure, by adding beads to it. And by default, it just creates whatever it wants to. But the bead pattern allows you to force either a linear, a circular, or a radial bead pattern onto your, uh, onto your surfaces. But that does require just surfaces, and uh, um, then you can establish the pattern. Otherwise, you just do it, and it, it comes up with its own. I actually haven't run one in Inspire. It'd be kind of fun to do that. Let me uh, 
Let's see what it comes up with. So if I come here to geometry, it will just will be simple and just create a big, big flat plate here. And if I come here and structure, and I put a constraint on this edge, and I need to come to part here. Uh, where do I define the thickness? Interesting. It's got to be, a, oh, there it is, thickness right there. So I select th thickness, I'll say it's uh, two millimeter. And then I come here and I put a force on that side right there. Not 10,000 newtons, we'll say 50 newtons. And now I come here, run my optimization, and I will do it as a uh, topography. Um, so minimum width, dry angle. So those are the uh, minimum width is how thin any bead can be. Dry angle is the angle of the edges of the bead. And then maximum depth is how deep a bead can be. Um, and then we'll just run this real quick, and I'll show you what uh, topography does. Oh, crud. Helps if I define this as a design space. There we go. OK. So now you see how it develops a bead structure. And you'll see kind of the randomness of the bead structure. And almost in a lot of ways will look like a mountain chain. Um, and then we'll put, uh, we'll put a, a bead pattern constraint on there, and you'll see, you'll see the difference. While this is working, another optimization that we can do is a lattice optimization. Lattice optimization is really cool, uh, though it's in its infancy right now. I, I know the last time I ran it, it took forever to, to run. But um, top of, topological optimization, the math behind it is what it does is uh, it doesn't actually get rid of elements. It takes all of the elements in your design space and it varies the density of them, or what we call, they call it the density method. It takes a numeric value between 0 and 1 and multiplies it by the Jung's modulus of the material for every single element. So knowing that the Jung's modulus is basically all that an element can give. With its Jung's modulus, that's the most it can give. If I multiply that Jung's modulus by 0.5, then that element is contributing half of, of what it is. Plus, that element has lost its density, so it's half the density. So it's reduced the weight of the model as well. What topographical analysis actually is doing is altering the density of the elements, making elements that are in the load path a one density, and making elements that are away from the load path varying degrees of density from one all the way down to zero. So in reality, what we do is we set up set a cutoff level. Mm. Any element that has a density below three, throw away. Mm. Every element above three or 0.3, mm. we keep. So we convert a spectrum into a binary, yes or no. Mm. What Lattice allows us to do is actually keep that spectrum by saying, OK, every element that has a density of one, we absolutely keep. But I can represent, using a lattice structure, 50% density of an element by representing it with a bunch of little lines, little lattice structure, instead of the actual element. So you end up with a truly optimized design by taking the entire spectrum of element densities by working it into a lattice. And the only reason that we can even do that now is because of 3D printing. You obviously can't manufacture a lattice structure. Um, so what we tend to end up with uh, and why uh, the origin of Optim uh, Optistruct, if you take a, a human bone, or any bone for that matter, and you cut it, you look inside, it's an it's a outer shell, solid shell, but inside there's a network of lattice in there, which makes it incredibly light but incredibly strong. We now can simulate that exactly by using lattice to represent the, the semi-dense elements. And then we can 3D print that. It's beginning to take off. Uh, not, it's not totally widely used yet, but it's beginning to take off. 
I won't even bother with an analysis on it because the analyses take forever to do. Um, the other issue is getting the, right now I'm not entirely sure we have a good way of getting the lattice structure out of Inspire and into, say, a 3D printer, but that's being worked on as well. So we've got the technology there, we just aren't really utilizing it yet because there's no convenient way to, to do that. Um, so is the ladder structure preset or uh, No, so uh, actually with the lattice, uh, where is it, filled with one hundred. Um, if my understanding is correct, that is basically you have certain patterns, yeah, that and I'm, then you just distribute the pattern right. all over the, the whole. Right. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't see that in here. In Inspire, if you use the native Optistruct, yeah, we actually. So you have like uh, 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 square, oh, okay. uh, uh, hexahedral got pattern. Got um, I don't see where we can select that in here. Yeah. So I don't know if we necessarily have that. Um, and again, I haven't really looked into here. So if you absolutely want a pattern, you have to use the native Optistruct. How are we doing with okay? So the optimization's plodding along. So we'll see the yeah, we'll see the topological optimizations or topographical. Oh, is your, yours got done? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with my machine. <laughs> you have. It's taking forever to run analyses. Oh and, really? Yeah. There's something wrong with it, and systems reloaded it with a new instance of Windows, and that resolves some of the graphical issues I have. But it is just going dirt slow. <laughs> but there you go. So that's a representation of the bead structure there. Oh. Okay. So if you rotate that around, um, okay. so flip so it around. It. Yeah, it takes time. I, uh, I I click the uh, the smooth surfaces. Oh okay. Oh, like, oh yeah, yeah. That's okay. Like, there you go. Yeah. So that that's what that's going to do is it's going to smooth. Oh, that's so cool. flip it around. You'll see that. Uh, uh, flip it. So you see that's actual beads that are that are worked so into there. So that's a much stiffer sheet. Yeah. Though. Yeah. So it determines where how where beads should be to stiffen that sheet up. Okay based upon the load you put on. And then the bead pattern forces either a linear pattern as opposed to just this kind of random, uh, or you can end up with a circular pattern so it's like ripples in the water coming out, mm -hmm. or a radial pattern that'll work off of a center. So you're, just, you're driving uh, the, the pattern as opposed to allowing it to just be a freeform pattern. So with the topological optimization, you said it gives you zero to one yeah, but the point three in some capacity helps with the load, and so getting rid of that would that not truly give you the most accurate result? Well, that's why that's why we started with lattice okay. because lattice gives you what we're getting is just about the best. Okay, with lattice you're getting an actual representation. And I know when you optimize your parts with the topological, it's not smooth at all. Right. It would, is it? Uh, with the at all, no, 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 because uh, what ends up happening is if you imagine the way that, the, again, we don't talk about elements, but we know that elements are there, mm -hmm. the element becomes essentially the pixel of your, of your part. Mm -hmm. So if an element is there or not there, each element, way, the, way, the reason you're not seeing it smooth is because the faces of those tetrahedral elements mm -hmm. tend to form like a faceted shape to it. Okay. Uh, so the lattice will smooth it out a little bit because you're putting lattice in there, but anywhere that you get rid of an element, it's still going to be a faceted face. And that's what that, uh, that fit does. Uh, when, you, when you're done with the optimization, you can click fit and it wraps smooth surfaces around it, kind of like what he did with the, uh, with the uh, so topographical. Not, that's not polynerbs, though. No, no, polynerbs, polynerbs is actually creating smooth tubes yeah. following the thing. Oh, okay. So yeah, so this is what I got. That's what I got with mine, so, and that's what I mean by, you know, it almost looks like, you know, a topographical map of a, of a mountain range, but that's how it determined the, uh, the optimization to, uh, to be. And then we can increase or decrease the, uh, the uh, definition of the ribs with the slider bar. So to follow up your question, I think right now you still need to take the result of the topological optimization. As a reference, yep. And right. do the design iteration yep. by yourself, by right. the engineer yourself. But there are some uh, new research ongoing, try to generate the the, uh, the final design just by topology optimization. 
but still it's, it's yeah. under development. Yeah. 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 Just kind of a strange question. So like a bike shape per se. Have you guys like looked at that to see if running <laughs> like optimizing it would lead to the same sort of bike yep. frame that yeah, is it does. Okay. We've even done it with uh, with uh, suspension bridges. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, I, it, I don't have it with me, but at one of my presentations, I've got that in there. Somebody, uh, because we, in Michigan we have the, the Mackinac Bridge, <laughs> up north, so we, somebody modeled that and created design space along, and it actually created very thick elements running up to each one of the pylons and then coming down. And then it wasn't the perfect linear thing that you get on a standard suspension bridge, but you saw the, the network of, of lines running from the big cable. So obviously we got suspension bridges right too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's what we've done before optimization, obviously through a lot of trial and error and experimentation and stuff like that, mm -hmm. is now being proved out with, with optimization. And a bike structure is pretty close to the optimum shape that okay. you get it. Uh, they actually did it with a, uh, a motorcycle. Um, uh, somebody had created a, uh, a design space with, that was the motorcycle. We've got, uh, we've got three little 3D printed models of it that start with the original motorcycle, the design space, the IX4 models, uh, the optimized shape, and then what they took that optimized shape to, to be. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's neat, it's neat stuff and people, people just, a lot of people are doing it just on, on, on a whim, you know, well, let's see if bikes are right. Yeah. And you model it up and sure enough they are. We ended up with a lot of little filamenty things running from the post, but you still get that general triangular shape with the yeah. core coming down, and then some support structure in there that truly makes it optimal. Okay. Yeah. But bikes are correct. You can feel content. <laughs> you can yeah, feel okay. content riding your bikes. They are they are optimized properly. So. Oh, I have one question. Yeah. So for the file import functions, mm -hmm. you can take. Uh, you can import the. Uh, File yeah, so but don't use the mesh. Yeah, don't use import. Uh, yeah. Use uh, open. Open. Import. Import will bring something into the model that you currently have. If oh, you're okay. bringing in data, uh, we do allow you to open uh, uh, Optistruct data, yeah. which is mesh. Uh, honestly, I have no clue what it would do though, because I've never done that. Yeah, but there, we, there's an option STL file. That's yeah. Mesh. mesh. Yeah, that's that's going to be a mesh too. I don't know, I don't know, I because I've never done it. So we'd we'd have to we'd have to try it. Because um. <coughs> there are tons of models online. They are in STL file format. Mm -hmm. So, but no one is using it right now because yeah. it just look nice, but it, it's useless. I yeah. would say. <laughs> now, how to utilize them? That's that's a big yeah. challenge. Right now. Yeah. yeah, I would just suggest just bring down the STL files and, and try bringing it in, um, and then let me know. Yeah, if there's you any can, help. Have, can have a files, find some mesh file and test it out, and report some difficulty or problems to me, and I can yeah. have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I will, I will work with you on that. Yeah, yeah I, countless times I have just quick little webinars with professors uh, around, the, around the country, uh, just resolving some issues. I get to it as, as quickly as I can possible. That was what I was doing that other day with yeah. the guy from Michigan Tax. So. Good, good. Yeah. So I'm here to help uh, remotely, or I will. I am committed to coming here twice a year, once in the <laughs> first semester and once in the second. So. Good. So um, other things. Uh, we do have the ability to do motion analysis in Inspire as well. If you go to the motion tab, uh, motion analysis is pretty slick. Um, what we can do, uh, where did I put that? Oh, there it is. So this, uh, somebody did this, this uh, front end loader here. Take a second to come up. So it's doing the uh, the mashing, or no? Right now it's just bringing the model. Oh, in. Just bringing the model. Yeah. Um, cool. cool. Yeah. So with this, uh, what they did is they modeled up this uh, this front end loader. They just brought the the geometry in, and then uh, they auto connected it by creating these little pin joints at all of the uh, all of the the connected joints. 
And then what they did was they're going to use this in an optimization. The idea being they wanted to optimize this bracket right here. So they created a design space for it, and then they ran the motion. So I can run the motion. It'll take about two minutes to run. It simulates the motion on this, and the way that it, the motion is being driven is they put uh, functions on these actuators here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you can establish uh, the linear motion of the actuator, uh, and then you can establish the pattern of the actuator, whether it's uh, stepped actuation or, or I'll show you. I'll show you all those. Mm -hmm. And then what it does is it um, recovers the forces at each one of the joints based upon the, uh, the analysis. What's happened here? Oh, I forgot to change this. It only ran for, I need to run it for more than, uh, hopefully 10 seconds, I'll do 30 seconds. Can't remember how this ran, but it only ran for six <laughs> seconds, which wasn't enough for it to finish its, its motion. But it recovers the forces at each one of the joints, and then based upon that, you can run an optimization, and will optimize the shape of that bracket based upon the uh, their foot uh, recovered forces at the joints. You can also do an analysis. So if you didn't want to optimize it, but you just wanted to see the stress on that that arm, you can you can pull that as well. Um, but you see here, if I come to here, so if I select. A joint, it will give me the joint forces there. So it's calculating uh, all of the forces required. And when I uh, work with the uh, actuators, you see this actuator, this little micro dialog, uh, I can do a uh, uh, step dwell step. So it'll step, pause, step again. Uh, or I can do a single wave or oscillation, swept sign impulse, ramp it up, or uh, I can do a solver expression, so I can put in an expression there. Or what it says, uh, the step is just do it over yeah. over the time. And then I can specify the overall length, and I can do a start time and a duration. So the way that this is actually set up is these actuators will go, and as soon as they finish, then this actuator is set to go, which takes and tilts the, uh, the, the, the bucket up. So we can simulate motion in there as well. It's, it's actually not that difficult to do, and we can put springs in there, uh, and we can drive it from an actuator or from a motor. Can it also incorporate fatigue analysis or creep analysis? No, that, that, that's not here. No. Nope, not yet. Thank you. You bet. Take care. Stay dry. It sounds like it's going to be difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Oh, I have one. Okay. Yeah, maybe the last one from me. <laughs> so, uh, does uh, Inspire support some uh, like second uh, development based on this or plugin development? Oh, it's got a. We have a Python interface. Uh, if you come here to the view. Yeah. Uh, you can turn on the Python window. I could not script my way out of a paper bag, so I'm definitely not the person to ask that. But you, you can issue Python commands through here and, and automate uh, Inspire to a certain degree. But I, I can get you information. I can get you people to talk to. I am not that person because I, I, I program Hello World. It says goodbye to me. So I, I, okay. I, I don't. I don't. I can't program anything. But yes, we do have a. a, a a Python awesome. interface, so you can write your own custom scripts. Good. Okay. Excellent. Okay, well, I you, appreciate. You do not have any other questions? Let's. Thanks, Eric. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 it's a hot day for him. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Okay. So